What's up guys? In this video, we are going to talk about ABGs and do a complete overview of arterial blood gases. Are you ready? Let's go! What is an ABG? An ABG stands for arterial blood gas and is a test that measures the blood levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide as well as the levels of acid base in the body. An ABG test is used to check how well the lungs are moving oxygen into different body parts and how efficiently they are able to eliminate carbon dioxide. Normally, healthy lungs move oxygen into the blood and push carbon dioxide out efficiently during inhalation and exhalation. This is what is called gas exchange. With this process, the body receives energy while making sure to eliminate waste. However, if the patient has breathing problems or a disease that affects their lung function, the ABG results can be abnormal. In just a moment, we're going to discuss how to determine when an ABG is abnormal and what actions you should take. Why are ABGs important? As we discussed earlier, an ABG test is routinely used in the diagnosis and monitoring of patients suffering from critical conditions. Because this test provides a precise measurement of the levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide in your body, it can help the doctor determine the patient's lung and kidney function. In most cases, the doctor may order an ABG if the patient has the following symptoms breathing difficulties, changes in mental status, and nausea and vomiting, among others. In addition, ABG can help the doctor to assess whether treatment for lung conditions are effective, check the acid-base balances in patients with kidney disease, diabetes, and those recovering from drug overdoses, determine the presence of a ruptured blood vessel or metabolic disease, and check for chemical poisoning. What are the normal ABG values? For you to better understand the key elements in an ABG test, it is important for you to know the definition of all the normal values. First, you have the pH. This is used to measure the acidity or basity of the blood in the body. Next, there is partial pressure of oxygen, or a PaO2. This refers to the amount of oxygen in arterial blood, and it shows how efficiently oxygen is transported from the lungs to the blood. Then, there is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, or PaCO2. This measures how efficiently carbon dioxide is transported to the lungs to be removed from the body. Next is bicarbonate, or HCO3. This measures the amount of a form of carbon dioxide known as bicarbonate, or bicarb, that is in the blood. Normally, bicarb is transported into your lungs through your blood and then is eliminated upon exhalation in the form of carbon dioxide. And finally, there is oxygen saturation, or SpO2. This measures the degree to which the hemoglobin contained in your red blood cells is saturated with oxygen. These key elements all have different normal values, so we must talk about their ranges. The normal pH ranges from 7.35 to 7.45. The normal partial pressure of oxygen ranges from 75 to 100 millimeters of mercury. The normal partial pressure of carbon dioxide ranges from 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. The normal bicarb ranges from 22 to 26 milliequivalents per liter, and the normal oxygen saturation ranges from 94 to 100%. It is important to keep in mind that normal value ranges may vary slightly in different publications, but these are typically the values that you will need to remember, especially in regards to the TMC exam. What are the indications for an ABG? Let's go through some of them now. For the assessment of the patient's response to treatment strategies, such as mechanical ventilation. To determine the patient's oxygen carrying capacity. To determine the need for supplemental oxygen. For the diagnosis of respiratory, metabolic, and mixed acid-base disorders. To monitor the patient's acid-base status. 
for the procurement of a blood sample in emergency situations when access to the vein is not possible, and for the quantification of hemoglobin levels. What are the contraindications for an ABG? We talked about why we would want to stick an ABG, now let's discuss why we would not want to. Not all patients are potential candidates for an ABG test. Here are the contraindications for sticking an ABG. The patient had an abnormal modified Allen test. If you're not familiar with this test, we'll talk more about it in the next section. The patient had blood clotting problems. The patient has a local infection or damage at the injection site. The patient is on anticoagulation therapy. The patient is taking thrombolytic agents. The patient has a disease affecting the blood vessels. And the patient has arterial venous fistules or vascular grafts. What is the modified Allen test? The Allen test for assessment of blood flow was originally developed by Edgar V. Allen in 1929 as a non-invasive method of assessing the patency of a patient's arteries. Since then, it has been adopted as the modified Allen test and is used to check for collateral circulation of the radial and ulnar arteries in the wrist. The difference between the modified Allen test and the original Allen test is that modified Allen test efficiently evaluates the adequacy of blood circulation at one hand at a time. The modified Allen test measures the competency and quality of the artery and should be performed prior to performing an arterial puncture. Here are the proper steps in performing a modified Allen test. Step 1. Have the patient make a fist. Instruct the patient to clench his or her fist in order to enhance the circulation within the arteries. If the patient lacks the ability to do so, close his or her hand tightly. Step 2. Locate the radial and ulnar arteries. Face the patient and locate the radial and ulnar arteries. The radial artery is located on the thumb side of the wrist and the underside of the forearm, while the ulnar artery is on the pinky side of the wrist. Make sure to locate the radial and ulnar pulses. Step 3. Grab the patient's hand. Using your right hand, slowly grab your patient's left hand. You can also use your left hand to grab your patient's right hand, depending on your preference. Step 4. Locate the pulse. Place your middle finger on top of the radial pulse and your pointer finger on the ulnar pulse of the patient. Step 5. Apply pressure to both arteries. When the pulses can be felt, apply occlusive pressure to both the ulnar and radial arteries to temporarily stop blood circulation of the hand. Be sure to tell the patient to relax his or her hand while doing this. Step 6. Have the patient open their hand. This is done to check whether the palm and fingers have blanched. Blanching means that you have completely occluded the radial and ulnar arteries with your fingers. The hand should have a whitish appearance in color. Step 7. Slowly release the pressure on the ulnar artery. You can release pressure on the ulnar artery while keeping the radial artery occluded. If the patient's hand flushes, meaning that it turns pink, within 5 to 15 seconds, this means that the ulnar artery is patent or has a good blood flow. This is considered a positive modified Allen test, and you can proceed to stick the ABG at this site. However, if flushing is not observed within 5 to 15 seconds, this result suggests that the ulnar artery does not have collateral circulation, and this is considered as a negative modified Allen test. In this case, it's recommended not to puncture the radial artery at this site. You should either try the modified Allen test on the other hand, or move on to the brachial artery. How to stick an ABG. An ABG test requires collecting a small sample of blood from an artery. The sample must be obtained by either the respiratory therapist, doctor, or qualified technician. First and foremost, before sticking the patient, you must determine the best site for collecting the blood sample. Here are the possible ABG sample sites. The radial artery in the wrist, the brachial artery in the upper arm, and the femoral artery in the groin. 
In addition, a blood sample can also be obtained in a pre-existing arterial line. An ABG blood sample cannot be obtained from a vein, as this would instead be a VBG or venous blood gas. Once the site is determined, the respiratory therapist will then sterilize the injection site using an antiseptic or antimicrobial solution. The radial artery is the preferred site to stick the ABG because it has a good collateral circulation and it is superficial and easy to palpate. Also, it's not near any large veins and the stick is relatively pain-free. But I mean, you won't see me volunteering to have my radial artery stuck anytime soon. Anyway, the patient will be positioned either lying down or sitting with the arm well supported. You may use a rolled towel positioned under the patient's wrist in order to provide comfort for the patient and to hyperextend the site of the injection. This position makes it easier to palpate the pulse and stick the artery. After the radial artery is located, the respiratory therapist will then insert a sterile needle into the artery to draw blood. In some cases, the syringe needs to be repositioned in order to locate and puncture the artery. When doing this, you will withdraw the tip of the syringe to the subcutaneous tissue to prevent severing the artery or tendons and avoiding damage to the nearby tissues. It's also extremely painful for the patient if you're digging around in their wrist with a needle while trying to hit the artery. This is something I see a lot with students and new respiratory therapists. Not to worry, you'll get better at sticking the arteries with more practice and experience. Once the blood sample is obtained, a sterile gauze and bandage will be placed over the punctured wound in order to stop bleeding and avoid infection. The blood sample will immediately be sent to the laboratory for analysis. The specimen must be analyzed within 15 minutes after extraction in order to ensure accurate ABG results are obtained. It is important to keep in mind that an ABG stick may be difficult to perform in uncooperative patients, those with hard-to-find pulses, patients with cognitive impairment, patients with tremors, and those with a significant amount of body fat. In some cases, multiple attempts are needed in order to draw the sample. However, repeated puncture of a single site increases the prevalence of a hematoma, which is swelling of clotted blood within the tissue, and also scarring. In severe cases, it can also cut the artery and cause a significant amount of bleeding, so you may need to use an alternate site in order to draw the blood sample if too many unsuccessful attempts are made in the same spot. Again, collecting these blood samples can be quite challenging for some respiratory therapist, but as I always say, practice makes perfect, and the more you do it, the easier it gets and the better you become at sticking ABGs. What are the potential errors when running an ABG? There are several factors that can affect the results of an ABG test. Let's talk about them now. Drawing the blood sample from the incorrect patient. Obviously, this can significantly alter the course of treatment of a critical patient. This can be caused by posting the ABG results on the incorrect patient record or mislabeling the blood sample. Obtaining a blood sample from a vein instead of an artery. In some cases, inexperienced healthcare providers might stick the vein instead of the artery. In this case, the sample will be filled with venous blood instead of arterial blood, which will show vastly different results. Blood clotting. It is highly recommended to analyze the blood sample 10 minutes after extraction in order to avoid clotting. Analyzing a blood sample that has already clotted will yield inaccurate results and will basically render the specimen useless. Obtaining a blood sample on incorrect settings or support. This can significantly affect the course of the treatment of the patient and the medical team's assessment of the patient's needs. For instance, if a blood sample was obtained when the patient is still on supplemental oxygen instead of room air, the results can be misleading and can yield falsely elevated PaO2 levels. Air contamination of the blood sample. Air contamination can alter the results of an ABG sample by causing the measured PaO2 to read inaccurately. Contamination caused by too much heparin. Too much liquid heparin dilutes the blood sample and causes changes in pH levels and can significantly affect the oxygen and carbon dioxide values. Inappropriate mixing of the blood sample. 
Depending on hospital or laboratory protocols, healthcare providers thoroughly mix the blood sample with heparin immediately upon collection in order to avoid clotting. It's also remixed before it goes into the analyzer. The best way to mix the sample is to roll it between your palms. The most common error that healthcare providers commit when mixing the blood sample is vigorously shaking the vial or container. Another error is not mixing iced samples for a long enough amount of time. It is recommended to mix iced samples longer in order to promote mobilization and mixing of all the components of the blood sample. And the final potential error that may occur is prolonged delays in blood sample analysis. The blood sample must be sent to the laboratory for analysis no longer than 10 to 15 minutes after the blood was drawn. Any delay in blood sample analysis causes changes in the PaO2 and PaCO2 levels due to continuous red blood cell metabolism. Alright guys, that pretty much wraps up everything you need to know about ABGs. I hope that this video was helpful. And just a reminder, we have some more awesome resources about ABGs that I will link up for you down below in the description. If you thought this video was helpful, do me a favor, hit that thumbs up button because it really helps support the channel. And as always, don't forget to subscribe because we got some more awesome videos coming out soon and you don't want to miss them. That's it for this one. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. And as always, breathe easy my friend.